Yeah, uh, now that you bring up advertising, I think that leads us into an interesting rabbit hole to go down to, which is in general funding uh, of journalism. Now, wh what do you think is the current status quo uh, of funding? Um, well, it's uh, it's pretty bad. Um, I mean, basically every uh, journalism still very much relies on advertising. It's shifted in the last couple years more to subscription models there's been a lot more articles where you go to them and it says you know um you know they have ads but they still say oh you can only read th three articles this month and then you have to subscribe or pay to continue reading more so there is definitely i think a shift away from completely relying on advertising because either the advertisers realized uh there's a lot of ad fraud or maybe it's not paying out as much as it used to but Advertising funding is still pretty ubiquitous. And in my presentation for the Lightning Conference in 2019, I talked about how Bitcoin and the Lightning Network can help journalism uh, in terms of three things, censorship resistance, privacy, and micropayments, and that it can address the, these kinds of political and economic issues that journalism faces if, it's, if they're both used correctly. Um, And so with Bitcoin, you know, as we all know, you can open a bit, anyone can open a Bitcoin wallet and then they can publish or share an address somewhere and anyone in the world can send you money and they don't have to know who you are and you don't have to know who they are. Um, maybe technically under your country's laws, you do have to know who they are, but it's not a feature of Bitcoin. So too bad. Um, and if you use various privacy tools, then it's harder for anyone to know who either of you are, or at least how much Bitcoin either of you has. Um, in total, if you're not reusing addresses. Uh, but it's, for me, it's not just about integrating payments into journalism or even being able to make smaller payments, which is, you know, maybe part of the reason that a lot of people don't pay for journalism is the kind of lower threshold for making those kinds of payments is just still too high. And they'd like to be able to make smaller payments that aren't as efficient, uh, with fiat. But, um, I think it's significant because beyond just individual journalist choices about whether to use Bitcoin, if you have more journalists and whole media organizations and maybe even whole content creation platforms using Bitcoin as the native currency, then you have the incentives to counter the prevailing economic model of the internet as it stands, which is to violate privacy as a given by collecting and monetizing information about people. Um, since there's There's just so much friction to, besides, you know, the subscription model or the Patreon model to rely on traditional online payments by comparison. Um, and there's a really interesting section in a book titled Beyond WikiLeaks um, in an essay, Weak Links and WikiLeaks, How Control of Critical Internet Resources and Social Media Companies' Business Models Undermine the Network Free Press. Um, quite a mouthful, but I do recommend that book because um, it kind of summarizes the the Twitter order case that happened at the beginning or it opened at the beginning of December 2010 when the banking blockade was launched by the Department of Justice against WikiLeaks. And one of the things they did was they ordered Twitter to give them the account records of various people related to WikiLeaks and also argued that they should not be told that this was happening. And they also did this to other companies like Google and Amazon. And Twitter was one of I can't remember if they were the only one or just one of the very few, but possibly the only company who actually fought this. And one of the arguments that DOJ uh, made was the good old, you have no expectation of privacy because you agreed to the terms of service. Um, and there's some good lines in there by the author um, of this essay where he writes, uh, more sweeping implications flow from two other directions. The first is the poor analogy the court draws between the internet and banks to ground its decision as to why the companies of the former type must hand over subscribers information just as much as the latter type do. Twitter, Facebook, and Google's terms of service policies are about maximizing the collection, retention, use, and commodification of personal data, not privacy. It is as if the ruling is intentionally out of whack with the political economy of the internet so as to give the state carte blanche to do with digital intermediaries as it pleases. So I think that anyone, what, what anyone should realize after hearing this is that financial surveillance is not only surveillance through and through, but financial surveillance policies are what lay the groundwork for other kinds of surveillance. And many people seem to think that 
we can have financial surveillance or financial surveillance is like the only good form of surveillance, but we can still protect privacy elsewhere. And I think that this argument or this belief is fundamentally untrue, um, as we could see with this case. And so journalists should care just as much, if not more, about their financial privacy as they would privacy in other areas of their life.